Welcome to Go Vote Omaha, presented by the League of Women Voters of Greater Omaha. I'm Jerry Simon, a League member and your host. Each program will talk about issues that are important for elections. We hope to inspire you to talk about those issues with your family, friends, and coworkers. And most important, when election time comes around, we want to help you be ready and willing to go vote. Our guest today is Jesse Hitchens, Director of the Gender and Sexuality Resource Center at the University of Nebraska at Omaha. Welcome, Jesse. Thanks, Jerry. Th I'm really excited to be here. Great. Um, first of all, let's talk about, before we talk about the center, um, tell us about yourself and your background and what brought you to UNO. Yeah, um, so I'm originally from Illinois and a small town in there. And so I got my two degrees, my undergrad and my graduate degree in Illinois, and then I went to the University of Alabama for five years. Um, I worked at their Women's Resource Center for five years, along with working on my PhD, almost done with that at this point, um, as well as I was their LGBT faculty and staff um, president during that time. And so that gave me the experiences to, I think, go into a role like this, that it was a combined effort between a women's center as well as an LGBT center. And I was very excited for the opportunity because um, I actually passed up a similar opportunity coming out of my grad career. And so this was a really exciting opportunity because I chose to go to a university that was established and had a really strong um, women's program. So I was very excited to have this a second chance to build a center because this is building the program from the ground up. Um, so both me and my partner came up here and um, we're very, very happy and now since February. Mm -hmm. You're very new to Omaha. Yes. And <laughs> to UNO. Well, welcome. Thank you. But back to the Midwest for us. Okay. Uh, well, let's start out before. Is it, one thing I was wanted to ask, is it unusual to have the combined centers, to have the Women's Resource Center and the LGBT centers together? <laughs> Um, it is, um, because for m the most part, uh, universities have started off with a women's center, I would say in the um, 70s, early 80s, 90s um, era. And so women's centers have been established for a f significant amount of time related to the feminist movement. Uh, the LGBT movement happened um, in um, started in the communities in the early 70s, but not in the college realm until probably the 90s more significantly. So there, there have been established centers, um, LGBT centers and women's centers. Um, I think in our day and age, to arbitrarily um, partition those two things out is really, really complicated and harmful to a lot of um, folks, especially when we're talking about trans folks, um, trans women specifically, is to say, um, one is separated from the other because when you say LGBT, you're talking about gender and you're talking about sexuality at the same time. Um, so I think it's really important that we actually do umbrella those things because when does sexuality begin and gender end and vice versa? For example, um, when we're talking about sexual harassment, is that sexual harassment related to our gender? Um, that it's being targeted, or is it sexuality? Um, it's kind of a mixture of both. And so if we talk about one without talking about the other, it's really complicated and hard. They are two different things, but they're so intertwined. Okay, that makes sense. But let's talk about terminology before, yes. we, before we talk any further. Um, because I think there are terms that can be confusing. They s people hear them and they say, I don't know what you're, what you're talking <laughs> about, or they, or they get confused themselves when they think they know what it means. Yes. So why don't you define the terms for us? Let's start by saying the difference between sex, sexual orientation, and gender identity. Let's start with those. Yeah, so um, I actually want to change um, our culture in, I would say this is coming from um, trans activism and moving away from actually using the term sex um, because that actually takes away the power from people self-identifying. So um, I use the term gender assignment. So you're assigned a gender at birth. Because for example, um, the medical community is not imperfect. It is continuing to grow and learn just like every other part of our culture. And so if we put it at a specific, um, we know and we understand gender as a, a cultural uh, construct, um, but we put sex in a, specific category of like, oh, that's medical, that doesn't change. And that's just not true. We are changing and growing in our medical field all the time. So by saying gender assignment, that's um, more, we're saying that that is happening in um, 
in a cultural identity space. So gender assignment is when a doctor, everyone has a gender assignment, um, is assigned at birth. So when a person has a child and the doctor says, this is what this looks like, because doctors don't check chromosomes, mm -hmm. but they look at genitalia and they say, this is what this child is. Um, so that's a, it's an assignment process. So that's what sex or gender assignment is. Gender identity is how we think about ourselves. So when I wake up in the morning, I think of myself as a woman. I was signed um, woman, or I was signed female at birth. I feel like a woman, which makes me a cis person. So that means that my gender assignment and my gender identity are in alignment. Um, someone who's a trans identified person is where their gender assignment and their gender identity are not um, in alignment for themselves does not make them any less of a woman than I am right here. Um, so I think that that's a really important thing to differentiate between the two of those things. Um, so gender identity is, we often think we know someone's gender identity by how we're doing our gender expression. Mm -hmm. So um, I wake up in the morning and I'm expressing in a particular way because I want you to use um, she, her, her pronouns. I want you to think of me as a woman. But there's a lot of people who don't want to fall into any particular gender category and they try to mess with these types of things. Um, but, so gender expression is different than gender identity too. So those are, th those are three different categories. Um, sexual orientation um, has to do with how we desire people. There's some people who have no sexual desires and those people identify as asexual. Um, but we, most people, the majority of people have a sexual identity. So sexual orientation is what they desire. And that's not necessarily in alignment with how um, someone, um, their gender identity. Those things are all, those four different categories are all completely separate and they're not, um, one is not based upon the other. And so I think that a lot of people think that if you're assigned female at birth, then you're automatically a woman, that you're going to express in a particular way as woman, and that you're going to be attracted to men. And that's just not the reality of most people's experiences. Um, but we are conditioned to believe that that's, that's what we're supposed to do. Okay, that's, that's helpful. Um, the other thing is that I think most people are familiar with the acronym LGBT, but yes. here on the UNL campus um, with the, the Resource Center, a lot of people use the term LGBTQIA mm -hmm. and add the QIA. So explain the addition yes. and what those terms mean within the acronym. So um, traditionally, um, Q means queer questioning. Um, so queer actually is a nice umbrella term for sexual identity um, that means a anything. So I'm not, if I were to identify as queer in this particular moment, um, you don't know if I identify as bisexual or lesbian or anything in between poly, um, pansexual, um, or anywhere in between. And it's, it's that empowering space of saying, I'm not straight, but I'm not going to tell you how I identify. And that's really empowering. Um, I is for intersex. So going back to that um, sex or gender assignment, so that is for a person who does not have a particular um, identifiable um, gender assignment. So a doctor, um, more in the past, doctors have made assignments still and made uh, operations uh, according and, and has changed genitals. Um, more and more, our medical community is not doing that thing for intersex people because about one in 1,000 to one in 2,000 children are actually intersex, which is a really, if you think about it, um, at UNL we have 18,000 students. There might be you know, 18 students who don't actually know that they're intersex because we often don't check one chromosomes mm -hmm. to um, internal genitalia unless there's some sort of medical problem in relation to um, giving birth. A lot of people actually don't know that they're intersex until they actually try to have children, if they ever try. So, um, okay. oh, and asexual, sorry, yes. one more. One more. <laughs> Sometimes um, in the past it had meant ally, um, but the asexual community is actually saying that A is for us. 
um, f in the sense of they, they are very much wanting to say that asexuality is part of the community as well. So those are people who have no romantic attraction to people or um, have no sexual desires at all. And it's not that they're abstaining. Um, that's a completely different group of people. So um, asexual people just have no sexual desire and they just wanna hang and enjoy um, watching friends on a Friday night, you know? <laughs> okay, okay. Um, so now that we've talked about terms, let's talk about um, the Women's Resource Center and the Gender and Sexuality Resource Centers and what's the mission, where are they located, how are they related? Yes, talk about okay, those. so Women's Resource Center and Gender and Sexual Orientation are student agencies and I'm the advisor for those organizations. Um, and both of them have significant history on UNO's campus. Women's Resource Center was established in about 30 years ago, um, and then G GSO was established about five years ago. Um, and that, they actually receive funding from the Student Government Association, and they are well-funded organizations that do some really cool activism on campus. And so it's really an honor to work with these students. Uh, for example, um, the Women's Resource Center just won second place in homecoming in the student org, so we're really excited about that. But they're doing some things like bringing in guest lecturers, um, bidding for um, a Midwestern regional conference to come in that's an LGBT organization, um, as well as doing Take Back the Night and trying to do what they can to support um, local feminist activities as well as um, uh, local LGBT activisms like the um, GSAs in the community. Okay. Um, so the mission of the, the resource centers, really what, what yeah. is the purpose? I, I'm sorry, I did That's not okay. answer your question. No, you didn't. So uh, the mission is to support, I would say, traditionally marginalized communities because even though, we'll say, let's look at women. Women are graduating at a significantly higher rate than men are, but they're still getting significantly underpaid when they enter the workforce. So how can we make sure that we support our women effectively to make sure that they're getting paid in appropriate ways? And that's making sure that we advocate for them and they know what their resources is and how to advocate for themselves. And so one of the things that we do at, um, the university is we work with Start Smart, which is in connection with the American Association for University Women. And so we provide people who are exiting the university with information related to how to negotiate your salary and benefits and what do those things look like. So it's they're very much um, working on behalf of people that are traditionally marginalized um, and having those access points very much focusing on sexual and reproductive health and justice. Um, so that's like, I would say, the combined effort of both those organizations is really looking at the ways that there can be safe spaces for people on campus and feel empowered on this campus and in, in their future careers in life. Okay. Yeah. Well, obviously, inclusion is a really important part of both of the, the centers um, and the work that you're doing. And does that include allies of LGBT persons and how, how do you serve how do you serve allies and how can they help with the work that you're doing absolutely we can't do this work without allies I mean um, I think that allies um, do really empowering things and in, in the moments where queer people and queer trans women can't um, in the sense of there is time when, times when my spouse, it, we're having a conversation, right? And um, my spouse is male identified. And he's talking, I'm talking about something and, I'm, and I'm, I am literally talking about all the points and I'm making a really good argument. And then he says two lines, basically summing up what I have to say. And everyone's like, oh, that makes sense, right? <laughs> they hear him more than they hear me. But in that moment, he's being a good ally because he's able to get the message out and, I, and I'm getting tired in that moment and he's able to support me. So that's what allies can do. And also um, males in male communities, um, that is really important for men to support other men of saying, you don't have to do this. Um, violence is, is not something that is necessarily part of manhood. Um, straight people saying, you know what, I support queer and trans people. Um, so I think that those, those moments are really, really important and crucial for our goals, and we want to have them a part of that. One of the things that we do um, is a men against, we have a um, program specifically 
design for bystander intervention. So talking to men as well as women um, about how people can intervene and support women in relation to sexual assault um, and dating domestic violence, as well as um, safe space is focused on supporting LGBT people as allies. Um, so when you're in the grocery line and someone makes a comment about Caitlyn Jenner's um, magazine, you're able to effectively engage that conversation in a, I would say, educating and non-shaming way. Mm -hmm. Because the thing is, is that if we shame someone, they're not gonna learn. And that's our goal, is that people learn and grow so they do make educated decisions that are healthy for all people. So it's, pr it's promoting that discussion rather than kind of jumping at someone saying you're yeah. out of line. It's like more, how did you, you know, widening their, their thinking a little bit. Exactly. And I think that we, the, the patience that we provide people is really, really crucial in the sense of if I don't, there's people that have provided me patience in my life to help me grow and learn. And that's our also job. So even as a queer woman, I, I think it's really important that I, someone got me to a point where I identify in a particular way um, and they helped me get there. And it's really important that I do the same thing for other people who are allies, um, who are men, who are straight, who are cis, all those types of things. Because I need everyone to be on board for us to move forward and have a healthy and productive community. Okay, that makes sense. Um, what I want to talk about is that the center is going to be moving, is that right? In the fall of 2016, you're actually going to move into the Milo Bale Student Center on campus. Yes. So you want to talk about that a little bit? So um, the students, um, the two student org organizations are in Milo Bale's temporary on the third floor, but they're building a brand new space and it's all about inclusion um, for these new, uh, to really showcase that this is what UNO values, is that we want to make sure that people who are traditionally marginalized feel that they are at the center of the conversation, not at the margins. Um, so we are actually gonna be on the first floor, so when you walk right into Milo Bales, you'll see the Women's Resource Center and the Gender and Sexual Orientation, um, very large open spaces for just community building. My office is going to be on the side of that so that people, so I can have access to those students on a regular basis. Right now I'm, I'm located in the Welcome Center, so I have to do a little truck between those two, but the students will actually come to my office and I vice versa, but this will allow me to really invest more in just their daily lives, um, which is really exciting for me. Okay, that, that's really, that sounds really wonderful that yeah. we'll be all together. Um, so now you mentioned their daily lives. Let's talk about not just on campus, but can you relate your work to the wider Omaha community? I mean, the students, some of them live on campus, but a right. great majority of them, I would imagine, still live off campus. So relate that to the work to the wider community. Right. Um, we are really trying to build a network. Um, and one of the ways that we're building that network is working with our uh, community, our, our, our universities around the community. So in December, we're actually working with Bellevue, Metro, and um, Iowa Western. And we're going to be helping them build their safe space programs. Um, as well as we work with um, the uh, um, Cutie Pock, or Nebraska, and so that's a queer people of color organization, um, gender, uh, River City Gender Alliance. <laughs> um, I'm still new to uh -huh. Omaha, so I'm still learning. Um, the queer uh, youth organization, so that's also something that we, we work with. Um, it's um, it's the only one of its kind in the nation in the sense of it's run by students um, in Nebraska and it's the only one that doesn't have people who are professionally supporting it. So it's all student run and it's not connected with an actual university. Um, so that's really exciting. Those are the things that we try to do. One of the things that I have done without necessarily um, having specific asks is that community um, high schools have asked us to come in and talk to their, their GSAs about trans people. So I've been building panels of trans students and bringing them into their GSA so that the students can see there's life after high school. Um, and that's really important for suicide um, prevention so that people see that 
you know, you can live your life as a trans person and that's, and you will be okay. And also know there are resources in our community for trans people as well as queer people. So that um, we work with um, the Women's Center for Advancement in relation to uh, sexual violence, dating domestic violence, and supporting populations for women. Um, and we, we want to make sure that we build those networks up um, through this process. I've only been here nine months, and I think there's a really nice movement that's happening between all those organizations because it is, it's a women's movement, it's an LGBT movement all at the same time. Okay. We well, mentioned schools, and that sort of leads to, um, let's talk a little bit about the new policy that the Bellevue schools yes. are the first in the Omaha area mm -hmm. to um, have a policy regarding issues that transgender students would face, particularly in athletics, mm -hmm. um, but other activities. So you'd want to talk about that policy and how progressive really that pr pretty much is for this area? Yes, it's really fantastic. Um, so what it allows is that so going back to that terminology piece, um, so we can't see someone based upon their expression what bathroom they're going to use. We can't see it based upon their um, gender assignment or sex, but this policy is talking about gender identity, how we think about ourselves, how we feel. Um, so what they're saying is that any person who, you are gonna use the bathroom of how you feel. Um, and I think what the empowering thing is, is that it can change. So say someone is um, transitioning and they feel that, okay, I'm ready to take my step into the blank bathroom. They can now make that movement with, with comfort and support from their administration, which is really, really empowering. Because say um, someone who is assigned female at birth starts entering the male bathroom because they're now growing hair on their face mm -hmm. um, because they are receiving testosterone injections. Um, they're not gonna feel comfortable being in that bathroom that is for women. Um, but there's also often spaces within public schools that are also um, gender non-specific, all gender bathrooms. But this allows people to choose which one they feel comfortable with, so not not forcing them to go into a bathroom that they don't feel comfortable in. Okay, so hopefully other school districts in the area are going to look at their policies as well and, and come up with something similar, we hope. Yes, and the thing is, is that we have to start looking at national trends. So Department of Education has actually come out in relation to Title IX and said this, we have to start supporting people based upon their gender identity, not based upon their sex um, or gender assignment at birth. Um, or their, um, their sexual identity, we have to focus on their gender identity. And so this is a national trend and it's very exciting. Um, one of the things that UNO, UNO has the same policy is that you go into the bathroom that, you're, that you feel comfortable in. We tried to, there's actually a lot of spaces that we tried to have that are all gender spaces, uh -huh. but we want to make sure that if someone feels comfortable going in the women's restroom, that's the bathroom that they're going to go into. Okay. Well, now let's talk politics. We have an election coming <laughs> up in 2016. So what um, issues will be important to you, to your clients of the center, yeah. students, um, others in the community? What should we ask candidates about? What, do we, what, we should we, what kind of questions do we want them to answer? Yeah, I would, one of the things that I think would be really important to ask um, people who are elected officials is, um, and I, I always say that this is my opinion, not the opinion of UNO, is, um, well, I, I think it's, they, they support it in supporting gender identity and in their non-discrimination notice as well as sexual identity. But this is my, my specific political opinion is that you need to be able to ask your legislator is do you support um, inclusion of trans and queer people in jobs, uh, so in the workplace, in um, housing, those types of things because um, there's a significant, there's uh, about a 20% higher um, population who are homeless, who are queer and trans identified, and that is not tolerable. Um, there is a significant amount of people being murdered because they're trans identified. Um, the Trans Student Educational Network has actually come out and said that this is an ep epidemic, that people are 
be murdered because they just identify in a way that um, people don't feel comfortable with. And that's not tolerable. Us as Americans should not be okay with people being murdered for who they are. Um, so being able to ask your legis legislator if they support the Equality Act mm -hmm. and um, making, and if they don't know what that is, making sure that they do know what that is. Um, because these are things that I think are basic rights as humans that we want to support. And, and I think that that is a baseline. One of the things that we have focused on for such a long time is marriage equality, which is great. I want everyone to have a happy and wonderful marriage. However, that has taken a backseat to basic human rights. So marriage is something that is like a benefit after we have basic human rights, which is being able to work in the places that we need to work to get food, right? Um, places to live and shelter, right? Those are basic things that I would have to say um, the Human Rights Campaign, which is a national LGBT organization, has focused their monies on the, the, um, the marriage equality because of their donors, which was problematic because most people who this really affects is people who are homeless, people who are, so people are experiencing homelessness, um, and people who are being denied um, work because of their gender and sexual identity identities. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. We're at the end of our time for the program today, but thank you so much for being here and sharing the information with us. Um, maybe we'll have you come back sometime and yeah. we can talk some more. Hopefully, if you get the uh, conference that you're looking for. Yes. Forward, so mm -hmm. great. Thank you again, Jesse. Thank you, Jerry. For the League of Women Voters, I'm Jerry Simon, reminding you to inform yourself about the issues, talk to others about them, and when election time rolls around, go vote Omaha. <laughs>